Welcome everyone to an episode of Leading Wyoming, a podcast sharing the stories of Leadership Wyoming alumni. We're here today with Matt Kaufman of the class of 2015 and a partner at Hathaway and Coons, which is where we are right now. That's right. So tell me more about where we are, this room in particular, or a little bit about the history of your firm. Excellent. So we are in the Hathaway room awesome. of Hathaway and Coons. Hathaway and Coons was started in 1975. Okay. So a long time ago by, uh, of course, Governor Stan Hathaway and his partner Brent Coons, who had just come back from D.C. Uh, from working for Cliff Hansen. And, uh, and they, they started this firm in, che- in Cheyenne, and uh, it has grown over the years and, and gone through many changes, and, and here we are today. Awesome. Yeah. And how did you get your start here? What was your path to being a partner here? Yeah, good question. So uh, right after law school, I did what a lot of law students do, and that is uh, I had a judicial clerkship mm-hmm. where I worked for three district court judges here in Cheyenne. And during that process, of course, I talked to many law firms and uh, thought about what path I was going to take. I, I knew even in, in law school and before I did my clerkship that my, my true passion was business and corporate and, and entrepreneurship and that kind of stuff. So mm-hmm. uh, Hathaway Coons offered me a job. It was a great fit. Awesome. And I've One been and here done. every since. Yeah, yeah. perfect. Mm-hmm. <laughs> That's awesome. And, okay, so this is a little bit of a sidebar question. We were just at the judicial system last week with our session here in Leadership Wyoming. What was it like going through the Cheyenne session for you when you were in the class, given that much of the things we explore here in Cheyenne are part of your daily world? What was it like to be in the class at Great that question, because we talked about it. It was super frustrating because yeah. we yeah, felt okay. like we got very, very little of you know of the insight into into what we we experience here in Cheyenne oh interesting. so I mean both from the the legislative and the judicial mm-hmm. branch and then just sort of the presence of government agencies here and the way that we interact with government agencies on a day-to-day basis uh, and of course I don't take anything away from the leadership course and the fact that we got to experience the base and military yeah, sure, sure, which sure. is a big yeah. uh, big part of our local economy but in terms of of sort of the daily life for those of us that that live and work in and around Wyoming state government, it it kind of was barely even a snapshot, so. Interesting, Mm -hmm. okay, what do you think would be, so if that was the 101 with limited time, what types of experiences or conversations do you think would be the 201 or 301 to like really get a sense of how it works? Yeah, I think think you touched on already with the judicial branch, Mm because I feel like for for people that aren't lawyers and, and maybe even for a lot of lawyers that aren't in court all the time, the judicial branch is kind of the unknown, you know, mm-hmm. it's uh, mm-hmm. it's a little bit of a mystery. It's not very applicable. Mm-hmm. Um, we don't really under, I mean, everybody gets how the three branches of government works, but we don't really get to experience the mm-hmm. judicial, judicial branch on a first uh, Until hand Until you basis. really probably don't want to be exactly, experiencing exactly. it. Exactly, yeah. exactly. <laughs> so to kind of see, and, and, and even more importantly, because Wyoming now is kind of uh, going through some changes with its judicial branch and creating a new court mm-hmm. uh, that, that it's never had before. There's, there's just a lot happening. Mm-hmm. And uh, the other thing that's cool about our judicial branch in Wyoming is it's so close mm-hmm. to us, you know, like, mm-hmm. like a lot of things in Wyoming are. Um, you know, you can walk across the street and meet all of the Supreme Court justices, right. and it's it's incredibly close and accessible. Um, so, so that's that's a big one. Um, the other big one for me is just the presence of of government agencies mm-hmm. and the way that I mean, me personally, I interact with the Secretary of State's office a mm-hmm. lot on mm-hmm. a daily basis, and to understand what an office like that does sure. and how it impacts business in Wyoming or, you know, yeah. entities that are doing business in Wyoming or elections or whatever the case may be. It's just really fascinating. Sure. And that's true of, of lots of different agencies and right. lots of different sectors. So Yeah, interesting. We had Secretary Buchanan with us last week for a little bit. It was funny. I'm going to give away a essence of this current class, but yeah. they are um, pretty high paced and they want information kind of like delivered quickly. Right. And so we invited the top five electeds and they each had five minutes to talk about what their office does and then move to questions. And I think this class was like, you know, oh, finally, a structure we can get behind. <laughs> like giving the five most important people in the state hilarious. five minutes. And that they're like, this right. is good. We should do more of this. <laughs> um, which I, But it was great because particularly Secretary, Sta- Secretary of State's office, Auditor office, get to dive into a little bit more of what they do, which right. a lot of people don't know right. and don't understand. Yeah, that, no, that's so. exactly right. Like, for example, with me and, and Secretary of State's office, I do a lot of securities law. Sure. So when companies are issuing securities and selling investments uh, in, in their company, that's regulated by the Secretary of State's mm-hmm. office. Most people don't know that. They never mm-hmm. talk. They, I mean, they think about elections. Sure. And that's about as far as it goes. So, uh, yeah, the, the level of regulatory oversight that an agency like the Secretary of State's office right. has is pretty deep and wide yeah. and, and impressive. So, yeah. Yeah. Aww. 
Okay, and talk to me more about this new court or new judicial system that's happening in Wyoming. It has a lot yeah. to do with technology. It does, yeah. So, of course, I'm completely biased. I'll disclose yeah. that up front. <laughs> Perfect, okay. <laughs> uh, because I was, of course, Noted. one of Governor, Governor Meade's appointees to endow. Right. And so one of our endow recommendations was for the creation of what's called a chancery court, mm -hmm. which is what it's called in, uh, in Delaware, where one of the first chancery courts was set up. Everybody knows that Delaware is one of the, you know, the favored jurisdictions for, for business right. entities. And Wyoming and places like Nevada have started to compete with that. Yeah. But one of the, I guess, holdout reasons that Wyoming isn't making more progress is because Delaware has a chancery court where they have a court of specialized jurisdiction over things like business and corporate disputes. Mm -hmm. And companies really like that because it brings more certainty and, mm -hmm. uh, you know, uh, I guess, you know, known quantity to the judges and to the process. Um, but also it's usually faster and cheaper. And so Wyoming kind of upped the ante on mm -hmm. that. So we, we made our court incredibly fast. Uh, it'll be literally one of the fastest dockets in the country. That's amazing. And uh, so anyways, yeah, I was appointed by the Supreme Court to help uh, form, you know, be on a committee to help form this court and stand up the rules. And so we're in that process now and it's hopefully, knock on wood, supposed to launch sometime late next year. Okay, late so, 2020 or 2021? 2021. Okay. And uh, so, yeah, I'm really optimistic about it and super excited. Of course, you know, lots of people are naysayers and they say, well, there's other larger needs and maybe that's true and I don't discount that. But in terms of making Wyoming a truly preeminent jurisdiction for, for corporations and businesses, this is a huge step. Mm -hmm. And I think, I think time will tell, but I think 10 years from now we'll look back and think this was a really smart move. Sure. And, I, and it seems like we're at this point in the state where we have to take some risks, mm -hmm. yes, but we have to find these other avenues that can start to replace minerals piece by piece. That's right. Because it doesn't seem as though anything as large as minerals is sort of coming down the pike for Wyoming in the near no. future. No, I think you're absolutely right. And, you know, to credit the legislature, they've they've made some pretty uh, aggressive moves, you know, legislature, mm -hmm. as something else that's near and dear to my heart, the blockchain and crypto mm -hmm. movement. And it takes time. Mm -hmm. You know, we don't mm -hmm. we don't have a huge workforce here. We don't have a big infrastructure for new technology. And in, in the case of, of crypto or blockchain, no place has that infrastructure right. because right. it's brand, brand new. new. Yeah. But on the other side of the coin, Wyoming is quick and nimble and mm -hmm. The fact that we've been able to execute on some of those statutes and laws and create an environment where these companies can thrive, mm -hmm. I want it's, to be. we're seeing it happen. Of course, it's never as fast as everybody wants to see sure, it happen, but, sure. but it is happening, and that's pretty exciting. Yeah. What's your answer to the question? Now I'm really putting you on the spot here. What's mm -hmm. your answer to the question, we can bring in new businesses and diversify the economy, but it doesn't support state revenue in our current tax structure? Yep. So the tax gap, yep. right? Yeah. Yep. Um, of course. And, and I, in some ways I can't, I can't fault people for, you know, raising that issue because it's a, it's a valid issue. What I would say though, is we're going to like, like any, any good investment, right? If you, if you invest in a company or in a piece of real estate, you can expect that you're going to lose money for a while mm -hmm. before you're going to start to see that investment recoup and then, sure. and then make you, make you more return. And I think the same is true with respect to our workforce and our population, mm -hmm. we're going to have to have some sunk costs. There's mm -hmm. just no way around it. If we really, truly want to diversify the economy in a non, you know, state propped up way, mm -hmm. um, we're going to have to sink some costs into people and, mm -hmm. and providing them services and understand that that's going to cost us more than it's going to make us for a while. Um, but when we get more people and more diversified, you know, uh, service sectors here, I think that creates a lot more opportunity to diversify that tax base as we move forward. Mm -hmm. So, I think it's not a short play, you know, yeah. it's it's a long-term yeah. play, and uh, but I, I think it has to be done. Well, and it's tricky because it depends on what your net bottom line, what you're mm -hmm. measuring. And mm -hmm. if you're only measuring revenue to the general fund, then there's right. one answer. But if you're measuring jobs for our kids to come back to the state, vibrancy of community, general health and well-being of population, Absolutely. then economic diversification, entrepreneurship, technology, jobs, all these things are make a big difference in the bottom line of every other category um, and don't require as much infrastructure. I'm making, I'm making an assumption here, but don't necessarily require as much infrastructure as say manufacturing or something that requires shipping routes or a huge workforce to produce or something like that. Yeah, I think in a lot of cases that's true. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And I, I agree with everything you just said. We, we do. And, and I kind of look at it as some someday down the road, there's going to be, you know, opportunities for the state of Wyoming to make pivots in, you mm -hmm. know, our tax structure anyways. Mm -hmm. But the, the, the less diversified we are, the harder it is to pivot. Sure. 
And yeah. so we, we leave ourselves more options in the future, I think, by just inviting that diversification now. Sure. And so, yeah, it's, it's only going to get harder if, yeah. we don't, if we don't work yeah, on it now. Yeah, that's a good way of putting mm -hmm. it. How did you end up sort of specializing in this technology sector and focus on kind of what's next in technology and what's possible? How did you end up there? Yeah, great you question. You really like video games? <laughs> no, I don't, actually. <laughs> um, <clears throat> so the, the, the quick story I tell everybody is um, between uh, my bachelor's degree and law school, I worked out in Washington, D.C. for Senator Enzi. And while I was out there, I was introduced to this brilliant young entrepreneur who was raising money for a brand new uh, startup venture. And I was just in the position that day to be the one that introduced him to Senator NZ mm -hmm. and kind of show him around. And while I spent the day with him, I learned all about this process that he was going through of raising capital for a new startup, um, all the challenges he had, the, you know, where he was doing it in Wyoming. And I was just absolutely enamored with it. And he was mm -hmm. kind of the first person that I, that I had encountered that was going through this process. And so I got back to, to, to UW to start law school and I reached out to him because he lived in Laramie. And I just said, I think I can help you. Yeah. And so he said, great. And so that was officially my first, um, if you want to call it, investment fund. Yeah. I, uh, I formed a little entity and raised some investment capital mm -hmm. and uh, ended up being placed by my peers on the board of this company at the age of wow. 22. Wow, that's amazing. And uh, you know, ultimately became chairman of that company for a short time. And I just loved it. I kind of felt like it was, it was my calling. And so um, literally that was happening my first year of law school. And uh, then, of course, you know, after, after I was done with my clerkship and started practicing, I, I just, I mean, some of it was dumb luck because of the firm that I that I was with and, and being blessed to have exposure to really, really cool clients that, um, you know, some of them investment funds, some of them uh, companies that were aggressive growth companies. Mm -hmm. And I just got to be in the position of doing deals all day yeah. long. And I, I found that that was my knack and I, yeah. I liked it and I enjoyed it. And uh, so I, I remember making a conscious decision with my partners to saying, I really want to double down on this. Yeah. No one that I know of in Wyoming has, uh, you know, a graduate law degree in this. I want to go pursue that mm -hmm. while I'm working, mm -hmm. and come back and do this. And uh, my my partners all supported it. Uh, so I, I went back to the University of Colorado and got a degree, mm -hmm. uh, a graduate law degree in entrepreneurial law. And uh, I mean, the re the rest is history. I just really kind of spent the last almost decade now, mm -hmm. almost exclusively representing. You know, what I what I kind of call high tech, um, you know, high growth, mm -hmm. emerging companies. A lot of them startups. A lot of them really well developed companies. But and the secret the secret that I don't tell older lawyers is it's really not that hard. The old lawyers <laughs> it's just, just scary words. The, the, yeah, the old lawyers are just afraid of the terminology. Yeah, That's yeah. it. It's all the same law. Um, but I've just really enjoyed it, and I kind of gravitate towards the the startup community, and sure. I just I really identify with that mentality. That's neat, though, that you sort of stayed the course on the attorney side of things. It probably would have been easy to get started in this managing the investment side and sort of jump ship and just say, I'm just going to work with the companies directly and be a manager. Yeah. But to actually keep stay the course in law school with any sort of side job that's, you know, turning into something. Right. That's impressive that right. you were like, I'm going to do both. Well, I, that's one of the, the reasons I'll probably never leave the practice of law because it does give a lot of flexibility. Mm -hmm. And even, you know, throughout my practice, I've been a number of countless startup ventures and in even currently, you know, yeah. in, involved in a number of them. So I love that I can do both, you know, and that yeah. I can I can still dabble in some of those startup ventures and uh, investment funds and still still be practicing. Do both. Mm -hmm. I heard a recent statistic, and I'm curious of your personal anecdote experience of this, that entrepreneurship is a is a popular phrase and popular term right now. You know, you've got the Gary V's and all mm -hmm. this buzz around it, but in general, millennials and even younger generations are more hesitant of the risk that is associated with it. Mm -hmm. Having grown up through some of the recession and times of maybe not having benefits or financial risk, that sort of thing, that there are less small business owners and entrepreneurs than there were at this age for, say, the baby boomers. What are your thoughts on the kind of clients you work with and aversion to risk or kind of taking that big leap of faith? Yeah, interesting. So I, to be perfectly honest, I don't know that I've ever at least in my practice, noticed a stark difference based on age. Sure. There's definitely personality types, though. Mm -hmm. And uh, maybe it's, again, because I identify with those risk-taking personality types. Yeah. But there, there is definitely, and there's something to be said, and I've experienced it myself. I am experiencing it now with some of the ventures that I, that I go. There, there's a different risk metric when you take 
hundreds of thousands or millions of dollars of other people's money yeah. and they're now relying on you to do something with it, you yeah. know, and be honest and, and have integrity and execute and ultimately, you know, make them money. Yeah. That's a, it's a different it's risk different metric approach. and mindset. And mm -hmm. some people are just built to deal with that and mm -hmm. some people aren't. It's really interesting. Yeah. But I've, I've, I mean, in fairness to millennials, I've got a couple of clients now, uh, one of them, a, a crypto related company, incredibly young guys, incredibly brilliant. They have laser it. focus. Yeah. The risk is not bothering them and, and they're being incredibly successful at it. And, yeah. you know, conversely, I've seen, you know, some of the generations ahead of us who on the flip side, they're super yeah, hesitant, have much. a hard time making a decision and uh, execution is just, you know, not working for them. So I've, I've kind of seen it both. I, but I, I think I could safely say it's T to me, it's it's more aligned with your personality type than it is your generation. I, I think sure. this generation, the new generation, millennials are so creative, and mm -hmm. uh, I, I very much identify with their you know willingness to not always adhere to a hierarchy, you know, mm -hmm. and traditional hierarchies. Mm -hmm. And I mean, I see that with companies I work with now. I'm working with a company now, 800 employees globally, and they don't have an office. No way. Mm -hmm. That's amazing. And it's wild to see yeah. them work and to see them communicate with each other. Sure. And most of them are millennials. And it's fascinating and uh, yeah. in some ways infuriating too. But <laughs> but on the flip side, I've also worked with really yeah. large companies that, that adhere so much to the hierarchy and the, the bureaucracy that they just get stuck. Yeah. And so, uh, yeah, I, I'm kind of, I find that invigorating sometimes. But to your point, I also probably, in fairness, don't come across a lot of millennials that have a real, you know, I don't know, individual ability to execute large business plans. Sure, you know, they, sure. they're, they're usually the pretty self-aware that we need, we yeah. need help. Sure. And so, but that's, yeah. that's not a bad thing either. Yeah. Oh, interesting. Mm -hmm. I bet it's a, a lot of fun for you to get to be on this edge of new ideas, new things, seeing what's landing, what people are interested in, where things go. Yeah. No, I, I very much thrive on it. I joke with some of my partners that I think it, hopefully keeps me safe from malpractice because I'm doing things that nobody else does. Yeah. And so at least nobody can tell me I'm wrong. <laughs> that's amazing. <laughs> I don't know if that's really true. You're writing the rules, you can't break them. <laughs> but uh, no, I very much enjoy, uh, and I, that's kind of, uh, for me, what makes it exciting every day is mm -hmm. living and working in spaces where truly nobody knows nobody the answers. There, there aren't right or wrong answers. Yeah, it is a sandbox. We're just yeah. doing our best to figure out and, and pave a way. And, and I, I really thrive off that. I, I, I love that part of it. Yeah. For those who aren't as familiar with some of the legislation that's passed in the last couple of years, mm -hmm. what are a couple of things you're really proud of Wyoming? Obviously the Chancellor Court that you just mentioned, but other things that you're proud of Wyoming for getting out front on and when you are talking to businesses in that sector that they are surprised or impressed or want to know more because yeah. of that. Well, so um, I'll, I'll start with the obvious one first just because I'm, I'm living and working in it now. But I mean, the, the blockchain crypto, uh, phenomenon, I'll call it, that's happened mm -hmm. in Wyoming, truly is remarkable. I've, mm -hmm. I, I, I keep telling everybody around here, we'll probably never see anything like this again in my lifetime, just because there is a global conversation happening, truly a global conversation and this movement. And Wyoming, because of this legislative activity, has injected itself in the epicenter of this conversation. So and it's just absolutely unbelievable. And so, um, of course, I won't take the time now to explain all the things that Wyoming did to do that, but just to see some of that now come to fruition and mm -hmm. some of the companies that are that are coming and are taking advantage. And it didn't happen overnight. Mm -hmm. You know, it's taking mm -hmm. time to kind of uh, flesh out and yeah, develop yeah. Uh, what this all means and how it could be really uh, used beneficially for these companies. But it is happening. Mm -hmm. And so I'm, I'm currently representing, uh, we counted the other day, five companies in the blockchain crypto space that have either hired or are hiring people in Wyoming. Wow. And so, I mean, that's... And that wouldn't have happened without That's not insignificant, you know? Yeah. That's really not yeah. insignificant. So, um, so anyways, that, that to me is really mm -hmm. exciting just to be, again, on the forefront. Um, something else Wyoming's done, again, near and dear to my heart, but uh, the advances we've made with computer education mm -hmm. and making that a priority, in my opinion, we haven't done nearly enough, and that's uh, we shouldn't be done with that. But we nonetheless have made some strides mm -hmm. and, and kind of re-brought that back into, into focus going forward. Mm -hmm. And I, again, I don't think we can underestimate how important that is. I mean, that's mm -hmm. just, it's just a necessary skill for today's workforce. And setting Doesn't matter the who you are for mm -hmm. the next generation. Yep. And you were on the ground with Array a little bit and standing that up. Yeah, I was one of the founders yeah, talk of, about of Array. That. Yeah, um, so, so Bob Jensen mm -hmm. um, and Gannett Peak Technical Resources, which is a coding shop here in Cheyenne. And, Ty Fagan and uh, uh, truly the three of us, I think we were literally having lunch one day 
and we were just sort of lamenting about um, coding schools and mm-hmm. how, you know, again, the University of Wyoming is great and we're all gigantic fans of the university, but not everybody needs a bachelor's degree to do, you know, Code. specific mm-hmm. jobs and not everybody, not every company wants to pay, quite sure. frankly, a bachelor's uh, level computer coder. And, and I've just experienced it with so many of my clients. I hear it day in and day out that we need more mm-hmm. yeah, coders, we need shortage. more software talent. Mm-hmm. Um, and that is a big impediment, I think, to Wyoming growing that that uh, mm-hmm. economic sector. So anyways, we um, just happened to know a guy down in Denver that was involved in a coding school. So we literally took a day uh, with some of the members of the business council. Mm-hmm. Uh, this is like five years ago now. And we went down and we toured as many coding schools mm-hmm. as we could in one day down in Denver. And we basically picked the model that we liked the best and yeah. that we thought would work in Cheyenne. And we said, let's do this. And so we self-funded it. We, we all raised money and, awesome. and, and raised the equity. Um, and so I was, uh, again, fortunate to be named the chairman of Array. So I was the chairman for three years. And we just, again, it was, it was I mean, we did it, of course, to make money. Uh, but we, uh, we really thought we could make a difference in mm-hmm. Wyoming first, but also um, selfishly, we kind of had a downtown Cheyenne mission sure. in mind as yeah. well because any education presence is always a good presence right. in it's any local in community. Any yeah, and uh, and who knew? But it's worked, you know. Yeah. And Array is still going. So we did exit Array. We sold Array last year. So mm-hmm. I'm not involved anymore. But I'm still cheering them on and still go to functions. And uh, it's just so fun to see. Yeah, it's still producing graduates and it's still mm-hmm. working. And you know, there were bumps and bruises along the way, with which is to be expected. But uh, to see it now be a meaningful contributor to the conversation mm-hmm. and, and sort of part of the, the local, not only economy, but just sort of the, the computer education um, economy, I guess I'll call it, is, is pretty cool. Yeah. yeah. And to lead the way. We had ET present to our class during one of our sessions on technology and he couldn't make it there. So we did a Zoom call mm-hmm. in and I wouldn't just give anyone the opportunity to present over Zoom, but ET <laughs> can handle that. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> the class was like, whatever he's going to do, it's going to be successful. <laughs> he, was, he just is so passionate and mm-hmm. so committed. And, and it's neat. I have some friends working on a startup app out of Casper, and mm-hmm. they're working with Array to, to finalize things. Yeah. And it's neat to see that it's there's a ripple effect. It's Absolutely. not just one place for one student learning to code. Right. It creates this ripple effect and impact across yep. the state. That's absolutely right. Yeah. Yeah. Awesome. Um, well, so one of the things I've been doing in these podcasts is reading some quotes from the Leadership Wyoming application that you filled out prior to oh, your dear. class year. That's the response <laughs> that most people give. Um, which one of yours is that your one of your hobbies is rock climbing. Oh, yeah. I did not know that about you. Do you I was still a, like I to w- climb? A, a little bit. It's okay. getting worse with age. Yeah. I was a rock climbing instructor in college. That's awesome. Uh, at UW. And I, yeah, there was a, an outdoor uh, education uh, entity over there called Solid Rocks. Yeah. Rock. And so I, I spent many uh, summers uh, rock climbing with them. Okay, and, uh, that's great. Yeah. That, I yeah. didn't know that. I, I too like rock climbing. <laughs> I'm uh, losing my edge, which you can understand, right? I can understand. When you're not doing and it all the time. it's one of those sports that you, you can't just do it once yeah. a month or like once a year. Mm-hmm. You, it, the decline is yeah. rapid. Yeah. <laughs> so so I've, yeah. I've kind of, I've introduced my kids to it. We, we go once in a while, but I'm, yeah, more I'm as not an near the climber I once yeah, was. Yeah, I know. It's a funny thing. I'm, I'm fighting that battle, but it's <laughs> happening a little bit. Um, so you, one of the questions is, what does leadership mean to you? Uh, and I love your answer, but you wrote, leadership is the unashamed exuberance of conviction and passion. Having the confidence to stand firm in one's convictions and passion, it becomes contagious and inspires others to action. Leadership is not saying go, rather, let's go. Which I think is pretty awesome. Yeah, yeah, that last part's probably a little cheesy and overdone, but... <laughs> But I, the rest of it, I still would absolutely believe yeah. in. You know, I, I'm, I am, and again, it's probably more a reflection on my personal taste. But yeah. I'm so drawn to leaders that are just passionate. Yeah. You don't have to be perfect. You don't have to have the perfect personality. Sure. But if yeah. you really have deep conviction and you know, mm-hmm. uh, really sincere passion, it's kind of hard not to be attracted to that. Right. Yeah. I, I think. I have heard this lesson that if you are nervous about networking or going to a cocktail party or something. The only thing that you need is one thing that you care about mm-hmm. and just talk about just that talk about thing. That. <laughs> because people are drawn to something right. that you are passionate about, regardless of whether they like it or do it or even care about it at all. Absolutely. Yeah. 100% agree. How do you, I'm curious how this relates to when you're working with clients who are in the startup space. Mm-hmm. How do you sort of gauge their passion and that maybe their tolerance for risk or their sort of readiness for what they're about to encounter, whether they know it or not. What are yeah. some things you look at? 
So, um, yeah, that's a great question, actually. I don't think anybody's ever asked me that. But we, um, myself and some of the other attorneys here, we talk about strategies like this. And probably this is going to sound terrible, and I don't mean it to, but some of it's for our own our own protection, you know, mm-hmm. we, we kind of vet people and see sure. if they're the kind of clients we want right, to work right with. Fit. We're very fortunate this firm to have way more work than we can mm-hmm. do. So sometimes we get to be choosy. And uh, so so oftentimes the conversations that I will have, particularly if it's more than one person, if you know if there's a group mm-hmm. of people, is talking to them about, hey, what's this going to look like if it fails? Mm-hmm. You know, like mm-hmm. how, how is this going to affect your, your relationship? What's yeah. your plan? What's yeah. your exit strategy? What does this look like if it just does not go? Yeah. Um, like you think it's going to go because chances are it's not going to go right, like you think it's right, going to go. Right, right. And it may be successful yeah, despite and, that. But. And I'm always, always fascinated by people's answers yeah. to, to those kinds of questions because um, usually, at least in my mind, the people that are more geared towards success are the ones that are willing to face that head on, you right, know, and right. to think about it mm-hmm. and to plan and to create contingencies and, mm-hmm. you know, backup strategies. Um, conversely, I, I will often see people that, like, they just they haven't even thought that through. Right, it's they the first time yeah, it's occurred to them. Yeah, and that's scary yeah. to me because. Right. <laughs> yeah, it, it's it's, it's going to happen. Money, Some form time. of failure is going to happen, and that's yeah. okay. It, it, yeah. And that, but but it's, it's how you respond and how you move on. So. Yeah. So and I didn't mean for this to happen, but interesting connection to rock climbing. I, in life, am somewhat of or have been somewhat of a perfectionist, so someone who doesn't like failure, doesn't like messing up, and learning to rock climb and particularly sport climbing where that's a big part of the activity is that Mm -hmm. you fall Mm -hmm. a lot and Mm -hmm. to climb at your best you may fall off a route 50 times before you climb it without falling and just that physical act of facing something I was afraid of or that you know the falling was never as bad as the fear of falling Mm -hmm. you sort of build it up in your mind and then you fall and you're like oh I'm okay like I had protection and I knew what I was doing and everything's fine (coughs) and I think I saw a transition in my own self in my life as well of learning to face that emotional response to the fear of failing and getting over it. And then you can get to the solution quicker. Mm-hmm. You can get to the next step quicker. Yep. Um, what are So that's my rock climbing advice. Mm-hmm. What do you do with clients when they reach that first failure and the wheels come off? And you know, what's your role and job as sort of coach and friend? and Hopefully, person spurring them forward. <laughs> <laughs> great, great question. So, um, gosh, how to answer that? There's so many different ways. So, the the first thought that popped into my head as you were saying that is, it's it's incredibly common for me uh, to have conversations with people about you know, trust me, right? This this happens to everyone. Yeah. Um, I I used to have this little diagram that I would share with people. I don't have it handy or I would show it to you, but. Most people think success, you know, looks like this, right? Yeah, like yeah. a steady linear, and it's actually this, you know, <laughs> yeah. crazy thing with tons of setbacks. And you know, I've I've met uh, and worked with entrepreneurs that use setbacks to launch new businesses mm-hmm. and right. different things, and completely pivoted, and and you just never know how something's going to turn out. So I, I really do try to be, you know, um, positive and mm-hmm. encouraging to people when they're going through that, and sometimes just crummy things happen you know right. whether it's just litigation unlucky. or just unlucky or bad timing or yeah. whatever the case may be that's sometimes beyond beyond your control mm-hmm. um but boy gosh how else I, I respond to that in so many just depends on the person yeah it, it, really, it, it really truly does but yeah. i mean again i can say that the thing that i'm often encouraged by is is those people that are, are willing to just keep fighting through it sure. you know and yeah. even some of the most successful business people that i've ever known I think sometimes it's a it's a tendency of people to just assume that everything's easy for them, right? Right, right. and that they don't yeah. have their own challenges. Yeah. And I've again, I've been fortunate to work with some really successful business people, and they have failures. And yeah. one of the things that's most inspiring to me is those kinds of people aren't bothered by failure either. Right. And in fact, that's something that I've I've talked a lot about with um, some of the local entrepreneurship uh, organizations that I'm involved in. Is mm-hmm. it's just a personal sort of discipleship mission of mine that. There are, there are places in the country, and not that I think those parts of the country are better than Wyoming, but where failure in the entrepreneurial sense is mm-hmm. celebrated. Right. It's almost right. a badge of honor. Like, right. hey, I went and tried, and yeah. I did this on I my own. I lost a million dollars. Right. And people and are it, like, high five. It didn't work, but um, <laughs> yeah. but I'm back, and I'm going to yeah. do this again, and I and I learned from it. Yeah. And that, that actually is a big credibility uh, you know, determiner sure. for a right. lot of, lot of people in some areas. Yeah. In Wyoming, I think... For better or for worse, sometimes we we like to go fail quietly in the right, corner where right. no one knows. Yeah, and uh, I'm I totally understand that. You know, yeah. you, your people are embarrassed and they don't want to be ashamed by mm-hmm. whatever fallout comes. But 
that's just part of business. Mm -hmm. And um, and so, I, anyways, I, I'm I'm very much inspired by the people who just stare down failure, sure. you know, and just yeah. keep going. And to own it and to celebrate it and to share either lessons mm -hmm. learned or pieces from that. And I think it is different in Wyoming. Every job that anyone has is more public. Mm -hmm. You see your clients in the grocery store. Mm -hmm. You know, you're an elected official and you run into them pumping your own gas. And, you know, even the people you work with, I think it's what, something I love about Wyoming is that we have to get over conflict or barriers because you can't avoid no. anyone right, in the right. state of mm -hmm. Wyoming. That's right. Um, but I would I can see I hadn't considered before that that makes it a more challenging climate to fail in because it feels like everyone's, everyone's watching, watching. Yep. like standing around in a circle pointing at you yep. versus a million things going on and it's like well of course you know twenty percent or eighty percent of these will fail we just don't right. know which ones they will be and yep. it's worth it to yep. us. Yep. Yeah. How was that worldview and perspective for you sitting on Endow? Interesting. Um, I mean, it, it was good. I, Endow was genuinely a, a good experience. It was eye-opening in a lot of ways to get um, other perspectives. Of course, I'm a lawyer, so I'm around lawyers all the time. So to be on a you know a 20-person committee as the only lawyer was mm -hmm. really good for me because um, I forget that people think about right. things in a non-lawyer <laughs> non <ways>. way. <laughs> And so that, that was really good for me. And so I actually very much appreciated that. But um, having said that, even even with, within Endow, I was, again, sort of surprised at those people that were really wanting to take risks, big risks, mm -hmm. and kind of understood, you know, we might be criticized for this. We want to, we want to push yeah. and take that risk versus some people that I might have expected to be bigger risk takers that, yeah. you know, wanted to be more thoughtful and, you know. Yeah, uh, consensus uh, just, yeah, yeah, cons mushy towards the And not that, not that <laughs> anyone on, on the Endow Council was, um, you know, a problem or anything like that. It was, it was, it was a good team, but just that whole process was, yeah, it was, yeah, it was very eye-opening. But at, at the end of the day, I think what I learned more than anything was um, there are a lot of people in Wyoming that feel the same way that I do, you yeah. know, about yeah. it's time to take some risks. It's mm -hmm. time to really push and uh, there's a whole lot of those people that get really frustrated by the political process and don't mm -hmm. want to participate in it. Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, there, there's, of course, pockets of Wyoming that are very resistant to any sort of that change. Mm -hmm. I get it. Mm -hmm. um, but um, but overall, I was I was really encouraged by the message that we heard and kind of the, the overall involvement and just... I don't know, enthusiasm of people, mm -hmm. you know, re say. ready for something new. Not, yeah. not that there's anything wrong with Wyoming, because I hate sure. sending that message, sure. but there's, there's no doubt about it. As a small state with a small population, we got to fight to, right. to, you know, to maintain our competitiveness. And we can, but mm -hmm. we, we got we to keep pushing. Mm -hmm. Well, and I think, you know, that it's great that you can help be a resource to help walk people through and be a liaison between the political side that is intimidating for people who mm -hmm. say, I don't want to run for office. I don't have billions of dollars to invest in tech companies, but I want to do something. Absolutely. And so mm -hmm. I think that's a great way to gather energy and support and to hopefully help increase those pockets where they exist. And yeah, where for they sure. Are. For sure. Yeah. Okay. If you had a magic wand and you could wave the next round of legislation or sort of acceptance or training or something for Wyoming to tackle, um, and you just waved the wand and it was accomplished, what would it be? Mm. Oh wow! <laughs> You're like I don't even let myself many, think about how that. How many people can I offend <laughs> with one statement? Um, well, so so I, I don't know who I was going to watch this, but I'll, I'll thousands actually, upon thousands. I'll, I'll share. I'll share this. So yesterday, literally, I was in uh, the lobby of the Capitol, and uh, Dr. Joe Schaefer, mm -hmm. uh, the president of I LCCC, I just saw him at the coffee shop an hour ago. Yeah, Dr. <laughs> Schaefer and I were were just talking and chatting, and. Uh, I, I just asked him, I said, do you ever regret that LCCC doesn't have a presence in downtown Cheyenne? Hmm. Not that there's anything we can do about it now, yeah. but I've often used the phrase that you just used, if I could wave a magic wand for Cheyenne, I would yeah. love to relocate LCCC to downtown yeah. because I think it's just a miss that it's not there. It could yeah. be you know, a more cohesive atmosphere. And, uh, and anyways, he, he and I just kind of started talking about the, you know, the, the higher education system in Wyoming. And again, between my wife and I, we hold like six degrees from the University of Wyoming. I love the University of Wyoming. Would never be critical of that institution. But the idea that we have one university mm -hmm. for the entire state of Wyoming is absolutely mind-boggling to me. Mm -hmm. I mean, every single state around us uh, has dozens of, mm -hmm. of universities. And mm -hmm. so I think 
it's it's not just you know the funding problem that's mm-hmm. the problem it's it's a social problem it's a cultural problem mm. it's mm-hmm. an isolation problem mm. and so one thing that i would and again i i know on the endowed council myself and some others made people mad by suggesting that we could use another university but i think we need more opportunity in mm-hmm. wyoming for higher education access mm-hmm. It's just, I mean, it, that that's uh, an entry point for a uh, higher educated workforce. Mm-hmm. It's an entry point for business and research. It's sure. it's a gateway to a whole lot of things that we need more of in Wyoming. Yeah. Um, the other thing that really stood out for me, just from my time at, at Endow and, and just in various initiatives I've been involved with, um, we have, I think, a really... I don't want to call it a shortage, but we have a we have a smaller segment of our economy in Wyoming that sort of works and lives and and is in sort of the financial and professional service mm-hmm. sector. Mm-hmm. And again, I I don't think that's our fault. It's not anything we did. It's sort of a you know a function of circumstance. And yeah. but it it drives me nuts, absolutely nuts, when I hear of of governmental bodies hiring out of state professionals right. or you know yeah. going to Salt Lake or to Denver or to Billings or wherever yeah. for any of those things because we're exacerbating our own problem. The right. problem that we all complain about, right. and we're exacerbating that. And so I would really love to see us as a state, whether it's through medical education or legal education or financial education or whatever the route is, computer yeah. education, get more you know professional service, mm-hmm. financial sector, and mm-hmm. those types of jobs in Wyoming. We need mm-hmm. that desperately mm-hmm. as, a, as sort of a complement mm-hmm. to a lot of the other business, in, business and industry that we have here. And so... To me, that seems like an addressable problem. Yeah. Um, but well, and so that one is so interesting to me because we we as a rural state have, I think, generally had a tendency of shop local or mm-hmm. support local business right. wherever possible. And so mm-hmm. it's interesting that somewhere along the lines, the reputation became or the decision became that an outside entity would be more successful or right. produce better results, or right. maybe they just dumped more money into the markets and got people at that time, and right. then that's where they are for now. Yep. Um, I, I, it's interesting, I, a personal anecdote in my life is, I grew up with a local bank in Northeast Colorado. It got bought out, it got bought out, eventually got bought out by Wells Fargo, and I just ended up with a Wells Fargo credit card by chance. Mm-hmm. And then that's where all my accounts were. And I had right. this moment when I was in graduate school at the University of Wyoming, actually, where I was like, I don't want to bank there. <laughs> right. Like, I want to bank locally or right. I want to support a local endeavor. Yep. But it had just sort of happened that way. And Absolutely. I think maybe, maybe that type of thing happens for folks where they just end up in one type of account and those entities do a great job of holding you and keeping mm-hmm. you and nothing yep. against Wells Fargo. It's a fine company. Yeah. yeah. No, no, it's <laughs> but totally it's not it. a, but it wasn't a local representation. And right. So, yeah. yeah. No, I, I, uh, the, the last thing I was going to say, which is. You want is, another magic wand? I said one. You've <laughs> one already more. used like four. <laughs> one more magic wand. And again, this is, this is not a criticism of anyone because, um, I think it's just more than anything, sort of a function of our, our culture and kind of who we are and who we've mm-hmm. been. Uh, for for a long time, but I'll never forget. Um, it was like two or three years ago. My wife and I were in downtown Denver. Uh, it was like the middle of summer. It was June or July, and we're having dinner on this outside patio. And I'm not making this up. I even took a picture of it. Two city buses pulled up next yeah. to each other, and they had like you know advertisements on the side of the city bus. Yeah. One advertisement was for Montana. Yeah. And one advertisement was for Wyoming. Mm-hmm. And the Montana one had like rock climbers and mountain bikers, and yeah, there were a couple cowboys, but it was this very diversified sort of yeah. outdoor rec, like really, really cool scene. Yeah. And the Wyoming one had like an old guy in a cowboy hat. Yeah. yeah. And my wife and I talked about it for like two hours You're because like, we're like, yeah. we're in downtown Denver. We're trying to attract young workforce. Mm-hmm. Which one of those speaks to you? Right. right. And uh, I mean, I'm a fifth generation Wyoming. I grew up on a ranch yeah. in Chugwater, Chug Wyoming. Yeah, yeah. Um, you got the cowboy blood in you. <laughs> yeah. And, I, and I'm turned off by that right. because right. it's not so much that I reject or I think anybody our age rejects sort of the, the cowboy Western heritage, we mm-hmm. celebrate that, but it's okay to make that our own. And it's yeah. okay to modernize yeah. that image right. and allow it to, to morph into yeah. something different. And sometimes I feel like we're really, really afraid of, of to, to kind of let that evolve. That. And yeah. um, I think we need to yeah. as a state. One of the most impacting speakers I've ever listened to was at this community, rural community development workshop I went to. And it was on the philanthropy side. But he made the statement that, he was from Nebraska, but he said, rural communities have to reinvent themselves every generation Mm -hmm. or they will die. And he said, it doesn't matter how they rebrand. They just need people who care enough 
to decide what the character and the face of that community will be. And I, you know, if we think of Wyoming as entirely rural, I that I have seen since seeing hearing that quote five or six years ago, I have seen it in communities around the state where yes, there's pushback or yes, it takes overcoming some challenges, but they start reinventing or reinvigorating from within and taking right. an identity and, and having ownership of it. And and it doesn't always have to be young versus old. It's just that someone says we need we need a remodel mm-hmm, here mm-hmm. and it's just you know whether it's just a few facelift things or you know doing a whole new room for that community and i think as a state we have to be willing to let the next generation you know reinvent what wyoming will be and absolutely look like. and, totally totally agree. and it's hard because if you hard. reinvented the last version you're like but i got it all right, right. like mm-hmm. why would i let somebody else do it again yeah. But, and I think that, I, I don't know if you've seen this, I think we're, we're, there's a gap in the age group of people in their, I think, 40s mm-hmm, now. Mm-hmm. And so there maybe wasn't as much of a push earlier. And so now it's skipped a generation a little bit. And the 30-somethings are pushing on those doors and trying to make change. And it's hard. It's hard it to have that turnover happen. It is. I, no, I completely agree. Having said that, though, I can't imagine living anywhere else in the world because... Sure. Where else do we, we have value. an opportunity to have a voice um, yeah. like we do here? And so I love I love that about Wyoming people. You know mm-hmm. that that we all we all love Wyoming, and we're we're just such a um, I don't know we're, we're such a family driven, right? Sure. To, to, yeah. to to better this, but to, to echo your your sentiment, I agree completely that at some point in time, the the new generation really needs to get intentional and that, that was the word that came to mind about mm-hmm. you know the small rural communities it's the intentionality of this right. is who we want to be and this is where we want to be not just we're going to keep doing what we've always done because that's what we've always done right. that's what drives me nuts right that and we're failing at that and we're failing yeah. we're failing a lot of communities by you know maintaining that attitude yeah yeah well i know jared stack stack is a friend of yours as mm-hmm. well and i always enjoy thoughts and discussions with him too about what what can the next Wyoming look like? And imagining what's possible instead of what we can't do or what's difficult yep. to do. And right. I think and being proud to live in a state that that holds our values and that other people like as well. And yep. we tend to do this thing in Wyoming where we say like, oh, don't tell anyone. We don't want any more people. Right. And it's like for heaven's sakes, we yep. can we can figure out the more people. Like right. we don't have very many. No, nope, <laughs> like, we don't. We have almost more antelope than people. And so. <laughs> Um, I think that's a mentality shift too, but bragging on and being proud of what we have and knowing that there'll be some changes with additional industries or population or if a community starts to grow, you know, Jackson, Sheridan, Cody are all communities that have wrestled with that. And right. it's not easy, nope. but they, they also it also affords them more opportunities than yep. communities that are aging and, and dying. Yeah, no, I, I completely agree with that. Yeah. And I'm I, honestly, I'm quite frankly really excited about it and not to not to beat this example to death but in the blockchain crypto space Mm -hmm. i mean we we see it right now i mean i i literally can envision five years from now uh uh you know a wyoming that looks very different in that financial service sector than it does today just because of Mm -hmm. what this has done for the state and bringing new jobs and companies and sort of you know just setting that momentum Mm -hmm. um for for change and for for new business and who knows what that might lead to, you know, mm-hmm. who knows what avenues that opens up. And so I, I can, you know, it's like, it it's like right like it's there. Close. It's like so yeah. close with so many other areas. Yeah. And so that that's really exciting. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Awesome. Well, I think with your energy and passion <laughs> and exuberance, um, that will certainly play a huge role in helping get there. So thanks yeah. for being willing to take some time yeah. today to talk. Thank you. Thanks for not having a more embarrassing quote. Yeah. <laughs> Great. I can dig for stuff if you want. <laughs> awesome. All right. Thanks, everyone, for joining us. We'll be back soon with another episode. The Leading Wyoming podcast is possible thanks to the generous support of the Wyoming Dragicevich Foundation and the Wyoming Community Foundation. 